Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Face to Face broadcast with Daniel Rogers. Face to Face is a program that views the totality of Scripture from a fulfilled face to face perspective. Daniel Rogers is a gospel minister, a husband, and a student of computer science at Jacksonville State University. Daniel hosts the weekly Bible class on Sunday at 10.15 and 11 a.m. Central. Daniel is the author of an exciting and well-received new book, The Last Enemy and the Triumph of Christ, as well as many religious articles on a variety of subjects that can be found on his website, (laughs) www.labornotinvain.com. Tune in every Sunday at 8 a.m. right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. And now, ladies and gentlemen, join us for an exciting journey of empowerment, enlightenment, and encouragement as we study together face-to-face with Daniel Rogers. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Face to Face, right here on Fulfilled Radio, a boy you can trust. If you're watching us on Facebook, I have I have no idea what happened there with the uh, with the um, the live stream. It just kept looping and looping, and honestly, that was that was pretty bad. But I guess it's okay now. So, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I thank you so much for joining me this evening. And our subject for today is going to be the harvest and the end of the age, specifically uh, tuning into the resurrection of the just and the unjust and this is actually uh, part six in a multi-part series that we have uh, going on with the resurrection of the just and the unjust and so I hope that it'll be beneficial to you and uh, I put a lot of work into this presentation and so I hope that you'll be able to gain something uh, from it and so let's go ahead and hop right into it shall we we've already postponed it enough today No reason to wait uh, any longer. So, the harvest and the resurrection of the just and the unjust is a reference to a passage, excuse me, to a passage in Matthew chapter 13, 24, 30. And then that passage was explained by Jesus in verses 36 to verse 43 of the same chapter. So, we can actually uh, go there on our screen. And if you're on Facebook, you can actually watch all of this uh, live right as I'm looking at it <coughs> uh, for, your, uh, for your benefit. And so Jesus gives a parable to them, beginning in verse 24 of Matthew chapter 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and uh, went his way. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to them, Sir, Did you not sow good in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both gather together or grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And that's Matthew chapter 13 and verse 24 to verse 30. This is a parable, he says, concerning the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And so the situation uh, laid out here in Matthew, 20, Matthew 13, 24 to 30, something that has to do with uh, life and the kingdom, with, with the coming of the kingdom, and with the events that would transpire there. So notice this idea. Uh, you have separation and you have gathering. Both grow together until the harvest. Then at the time of the harvest, we see that one is gathered together and burned, and the other is gathered together into the father's barn. <coughs> uh, excuse me. If you go to the book of Luke chapter 21, we see a similar uh, thing being said. In Luke chapter 21, we see here, beginning in verse uh, 27, they'll see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things happen, 
begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at a fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. At the coming of the Lord, we would have the redemption of uh, the faithful. And with that, we understand from other passages, comes the judgment of the unfaithful. And this also has to do with the kingdom of God and its coming in uh, consummation. Not that the kingdom of God was not already in existence. Paul said in Colossians chapter 1 that he had been translated into the kingdom. But this is the consummation of the kingdom that was being received in the first century. You can read about that in the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 12. And so this parable that was concerning the kingdom of God and concerning the separation of the righteous and of the unrighteous, was explained to us uh, later on in the book of Matthew, chapter 13. In Matthew 13, verse 36, we see the disciples come to Jesus and they ask, say, explain, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. Now, pay attention to that word, world. The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Now notice the distinction between the word world and the word age. If you look at the King James Version of the Bible, you won't see such a uh, distinction. He says, the field is the world. Then he says the harvest is the end of the world. But do you see how that can be uh, confusing if you don't know what's going on uh, in the text? In fact, when you look at the, uh, at the Greek of these, of these words, you won't be able to see this very well, but I'm going to do my best to, to demonstrate it to you. The word world here in Matthew 13, 38 uh, comes from the Greek word cosmos. And you can find that in any uh, any old Greek concordant or lexicon, you can find this information. And I'm using a program called ESOR to find it out. So the word world is from the Greek word cosmos. But in Matthew 13 and verse uh, 39, when he says the end of the world, it's the word aeon. And that's why in the New King James Version and in other versions of the Bible as well, he says they translate the end of the age. Because he's not talking about the end of the physical planet there, but he's talking about the end of an age, an end of a system of things. And he says in verse 40, therefore the tares are gathered and burned into fire, so it will be at the end of, now I clarify, this age. Now a question that we have is, what age is this? Well, the question you can ask is, what age was Jesus living in? We think about Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And we learned that Jesus was living in the uh, age of Moses, the age of Old Covenant Israel. When the full of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. And the purpose was to redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, the adoptions of sons uh, and the redemption is talked about in, in Romans chapter 8. And it talks about the time of the redeeming of the body and the adoption of sons. And it's talking about the same thing that's being discussed here. And the end of the age of Matthew chapter 13 uh, is the end of the age in which Jesus was living, which is why the New King James translators translated it, the end of this age. And the age that Jesus was living in was the Mosaic age. And it would be at the end of that age that we have this, uh, this event of the harvest occurring, you see. And we'll talk more about that later. At this time, we see the Son of Man will send out his angels. They'll gather out of his kingdom all things that offend those who practice lawlessness. Uh, that's a callback there to Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23, and Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. They'll be cast into a furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This passage, Matthew 13, 43, is a reference back to uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. And we'll go back and research all of this and go over it all again later. We're just giving sort of a basic introduction to this text. <clears throat> now, 
Uh, going back to our slides, we see that the parable of the wheat and the tares is a, it's a very popular text that's used to defend a future judgment at the end of time. But see that that is never talked about in Matthew thirteen twenty four to thirty or verse thirty six to verse forty three. The end of time is never in a consideration. It's the end of an age, and it's the end of the age that Jesus was living in. See, there's a distinction. And this comes uh, from a misunderstanding of some key words and some phrases and themes that are used within this parable, <coughs> as well as a misunderstanding of some of the things used uh, and explained by Jesus. In fact, one of the things that's overlooked probably most is how this is connected to the preaching of John the Baptist and his work and his ministry and what uh, the influence that his teachings had on uh, the teachings of Jesus and even on the teachings of the apostles as well. A lot of them uh, point back and, and reference back to John and his work. And so this lesson, we're going to focus on researching the background for this parable, and we're going to demonstrate how uh, it was a theme that is the theme of the harvest that that Jesus often talked about, and the disciples talked about it as well. And if we uh, research it well enough, we'll, we'll be able to better understand Bible prophecy, specifically the resurrection of the just and the unjust that would take place at the time of the end. So let's spend a few moments to, to think about and to remind ourselves of the biblical background for the harvest. The biblical background for the harvest uh, is pretty extensive. Uh, the Jewish festal calendar, for instance, centered around the harvest. Uh, you look at the book of Leviticus chapter 23, and you'll see that that's the case. In fact, in Hosea 6 verse 3 and in James chapter 5 and verse 7, you have this reference to the, to the work of Jesus and to the patience of the saints, and they refer to it as waiting for the early rains and the latter rains. And that's talking about the harvest seasons. Not only is the festal calendar the background for the harvest imagery, oftentimes used in reference to uh, the study of last things, but in the prophets, there were several prophecies made concerning the harvest at the end of the Jewish age, and that would be for the purpose of establishing the new covenant at the marriage of Christ and his bride. Some of these texts, just as an example, are Hosea chapter 1 and verse uh, 11, and we'll read verse 10 as well. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 10 and verse 11, the Bible says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, that is, to the children of Israel, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. And by the way, Peter applies that to his generation in First Peter chapter 2, and I believe it's verse uh, 9 and 10. Then he says, Then the children of Judah... And this is Hosea 1.11. And the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head. And they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. And uh, that's God sows or God plants. And so this is a time when the people would come out of the land. This is the time of the harvest. And it, is, it coincides with the gathering together of the remnant of Israel. Do you see that in chapter 1 and verse 10 of Hosea? And so in Matthew 13, when Jesus is talking about uh, the wheat being gathered into the Father's barn, when they're being gathered into the kingdom and, and being blessed with eternal life and shining forth as the brightness of the firmament, uh, at the time of the harvest, this passage in Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, is an Old Testament text that talks about that same uh, time period. Another passage we have in Hosea is Hosea chapter 2 and verse uh, 21 to verse 23, <clears throat> a prophecy concerning the remarriage of God to Israel that will take place in the last days. The Bible says, it shall come to pass in that day, that is in the day of the marriage, I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, they shall answer the earth. The earth shall answer with grain, with new wine, with oil, they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow for myself in the earth, I'll sow her for myself in the earth, and I'll have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I'll say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. And so we have a time of the harvest. 
God plants Israel into the ground in order to produce uh, his people, in order to show his mercy. Now you go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and really 1 Peter chapter 1 as well, and notice what you have. 1 Peter chapter 1, um, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, the Bible says that they was born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. And so you have that this incorruptible seed. And uh, God had planted that in them in order that he might bring forth a bountiful harvest unto himself. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10, notice what he says. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. That's a reference back to Hosea chapter 1. And verse 11, and to Hosea 2, 21 to 23, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Do you remember who he was talking about here in Hosea chapter 1 and Hosea chapter 2? He was talking about Judah and Israel, and he's saying, uh, one day I'm going to call you my people, and one day you're going to be the sons of the living God. But how are the sons of the living God produced? How are they uh, brought about? Well, we, we learned it in Galatians chapter 4. Through redemption, he says in Galatians 4, 5, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And so redemption from under that old covenant age would produce their sonship. And so notice how all these passages are related. Hosea 1, 10 and 11, Hosea 2, 21 and 23, Galatians 4, uh, 4 to 5, to create the sons of God. And then even in 1 Peter chapter 1. And First Peter chapter 2, you have this seed being planted, and now they're able to be called the children of the living God, and now they're able to be the individuals on whom it was shown mercy. And uh, so the point is, is that this harvest imagery is talked about quite often in the Old Testament. Now in, in Hosea as well, and chapter 6 and verse 11, we have another reference to the harvest. And by the way, this is uh, in connected with the passage concerning the third day resurrection of Hosea 6, verse 2, in order that we might live in his sight. Notice what he says in Hosea 6, 11. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives uh, of my people. And so, at the restoration of Israel and Judah into one body, where they would have one head, and that head would be Jesus Christ, that would be the time of the harvest. And so, this uh, time period of the first century, the dispensation of the fullness of times, God was working to reconcile all things unto himself, both things in heaven, both things in earth, and things under the earth. And the consummation of all that reconciliation, including the reconciliation of Israel and Judah, would be the harvest. See, the, the reconciliation, the gathering of the people into the Father's barn equals the harvest. And that's what we're talking about uh, in Matthew chapter 13, and that's something that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. Now, notice what takes place at the time of the restoration of Israel. Notice what it means for, uh, for mankind. You see, uh, the Gentiles, in the time of the first century, were taking part in the spiritual things of Israel. In Romans 15, 27, he says, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors, for if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Now notice what happens. In Romans chapter 11, notice one of the spiritual things that's taken, uh, that they take part in. He says in Romans 11:15, concerning the restoration of Israel, and we know that now means to be concerning the harvest. He says, for if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit, that's Jesus, is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So what's this saying? Jesus, when he, uh, when he died on the cross, he died to that old covenant world. And when he was resurrected, he became the firstborn of the new covenant world. He became the firstborn of the new creation. Revelation chapter 3 tells us. And so him overcoming that system of bondage 
and him overcoming the sin that was magnified and the offense that was magnified through that system of bondage, bright future for Israel at the time of their reconciliation. And the time of the reconciliation, just to remind us, would be the time of the marriage, and it would be the time of the harvest that would take place at the end of the age in which Jesus was living. Another uh, another passage that we have in the Old Testament that serves as biblical background for the harvest that we read of in the New Testament is Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. <coughs> Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. Now let's notice that real quick and we'll get further to our lesson. He says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all those who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them either root nor branch. And notice what he says in verse, um, uh, verse we'll just go ahead and read the whole chapter. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. Now think about this. What does Peter say in reference to the uh, in reference to uh, his audience, the, the the diaspora, the scattered of Israel? He says in Second Peter chapter one that they would do well to take heed unto their prophecies, as unto a light that shines in the dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And that's what. Malachi is talking about Malachi 4 2, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wing. And he says in verse 3, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the days that I do this. On the days that I do what? On the days that I leave neither root nor branch. He references chapter 4, verse 1. The time of the judgment is also the time of healing that the Messiah brings. And so he says this in verse 4, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts in the, to the, of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have uh, several important things in this text. This is a time of the harvest. This is a time whenever the um, whenever the wicked are going to be burned up uh, in the oven of God uh, because they their their harvest was found lacking. This is going to be the time of the great and notable day of the Lord, and this time is uh, is indicated by the appearing of this individual named Elijah in like, like manner in Malachi chapter three. And verse 1, we find, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before him, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. That's the new covenant in whom you delight. In other words, he's going to bring, he's a messenger of the old covenant to bring in the new covenant. In whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure in the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like launderer's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi, birds in his gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And so we have, uh, again, this reference to the messenger. This is the same individual that's called Elijah in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. And this, this Elijah, this messenger, would come to make the way ready for the harvest in order to purify the righteous and to uh, punish and condemn the wicked who had forsaken the law of Moses and forsaken the covenants and the statutes and the judgments that God had made with the house of Israel. And let's point out a few things from this text. Uh, so this messenger, by the way, who is John the Baptist, uh, and he's called that in Mark chapter 1, 2 to 3, would prepare the way for the coming of the Lord in judgment to purify the priesthood. Now, this is not to prepare the way of the Lord to be born in the manger. Jesus was already born in the manger when John the Baptist came to preach. But he's preparing uh, the way of the Lord to come in judgment. This, is, this individual is also called Elijah. Jesus calls him that very specifically in Matthew chapter 17 and verses 11 and 12. Notice what he says. Uh, the, the disciples say, 
why didn't the scribes say that Elijah must come first? You know, they're asking about the kingdom. They're asking about the coming of the Lord. You see, the uh, the transfiguration was a picture of the power and coming of Jesus Christ. Peter tells us that in Second Peter chapter one. So they're wondering about this coming. They're wondering about the parousia, and so they say, "Now, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? In other words, they're wondering if this thing is so imminent, where is Elijah? And Jesus answered and said to them, Now imagine how hard this must have hit him. Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And so <clears throat> Jesus says, Yes, Elijah is going to restore all things. In fact, he's already come, and you didn't even recognize him. You see, the, the work that Elijah did, the work that is that John the Baptist did, as the messenger, as Elijah, uh, was not discernible by these wicked individuals but, or by those who, uh, to whom these things had not been revealed because the Old Testament prophets did not understand two things concerning their own prophets, concerning the kingdom and concerning the, the judgment. They did not understand the nature and they did not understand the timing of the things that they prophesied about. That's laid out for us in First Peter. Uh, chapter 1 and verse 11, searching what or what manner of time. Now, uh, so they didn't recognize Elijah, but Elijah had already come. Now, what does it mean that Elijah had already come for us? That means that the harvest was right around the corner, and that means that the judgment and the events accompanying that were right around the corner as well. John the Baptist was was, was young. And he would prepare the people for the day in which the chaff would be burned. And this is called the great and terrible day of the Lord in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1 and verse 5. This is the harvest of Matthew 13 at the end of the age. And we'll do a little bit more work on that here in a second. And so this prophecy in Malachi chapter 4 is one of the many Old Testament passages behind the harvest imagery of the New Testament. And let's do a little bit to further establish that. John the Baptist, he came and he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, why was he preaching a message of repentance? You see, in the Old Testament, the coming of the kingdom, such as in Daniel 7, 9 to 10 and 27, when the saints would possess the kingdom, was connected to judgment. So it's no wonder that the parable of the wheat and the tares is a parable concerning the kingdom of heaven. That is, it's a parable of judgment, because you can't separate the two. This message that John was preaching had led the Pharisees and the Sadducees to repent. But let's see exactly what it was that John was saying. In Matthew chapter 3 uh, and verse 7, we see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were coming to his baptism, and he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham of these stones. Now, let's, let's pause here for a second. Go back to Malachi 4. What would happen at the great and notable day of the Lord? He would leave them neither root nor branch. Who would show that this day was at hand? It was none other than Elijah or the messenger who we know to be John the Baptist. Now, Matthew chapter 3, notice the exact next thing that, that, um, that John the Baptist says. He says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear forth good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the harvest, or as we're about to see. This is the time of the judgment. And so he says, uh, just skip to verse 12 for right now, for time's sake. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. See, that's exactly what Jesus would say uh, that would happen at the end of the age in his parable in Matthew chapter 13. But he would burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's exactly what takes place in Matthew 13. But the judgment that that uh, that is being predicted here is directly connected to the role of John the Baptist as Elijah. It's directly connected to the purifying of the sons of Levi and the coming of the kingdom. 
But guess what? There are no sons of Levi, uh, if you want to take that in that manner today, because the records were destroyed in the fall of Jerusalem. So that passage has to be referenced to something that takes place prior to the fall of Jerusalem. But it has to take place after the coming of John the Baptist. And so what we see, the judgment that John the Baptist is, is predicting here, is the judgment that would eventually be consummated in the fall of Jerusalem. But this judgment that would be consummated in the fall of Jerusalem is the harvest at the end of the age. Do you see? What John is talking about here in Matthew chapter 3 is nothing different than what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 13. Do you, do you see that? Do you understand the, the importance of that? Uh, and this message even caused the Pharisees and the Sadducees themselves to repent. Let's think about something real quick. If John the Baptist, or John the Immerser, whatever you'd like to call him, was preaching a judgment at an end-of-time resurrection far, far distant in the future, why would the Sadducees repent? Since they do not believe in the Spirit or in resurrection. Now think about that. John comes and he says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he tells them, you're about to be burned up if you don't get right. And he calls them a brood of vipers. That causes the Sadducees to need to repent. But if this was a end-of-time resurrection judgment, physical resurrection judgment, that is, the Sadducees would have said, yeah, right, John, what are you talking about? Uh, we're not going to be uh, raised up to be judged, and we certainly aren't going to have you know, any, any spirit <coughs> And there's certainly not going to be any angels. But you see that what John was talking about in Matthew chapter 3, and he doesn't mention uh, a lot of those things, but he's talking about a temporal physical judgment that was looming on the horizon. And so the Sadducees were even stirred to repent, something that they would not have been, afra they would not have been afraid of if it was an end of the time resurrection judgment because they didn't believe in such. And by the way, the Bible doesn't talk about uh, that sort of thing anyways. So now let's, let's pull out some things from Matthew chapter 3 and Malachi chapter 3 and 4. John, referencing Malachi chapter 4, where the, they would be left near the root or branch, he said that the axe was already laid to the root of the tree. What does that mean? That means the last days of old covenant Israel had already arrived, and that the great and terrible day of the Lord was right around the corner. The axe was already laid to the root of the tree. Now, if you lay an axe to the root of the tree, you're indicating that that tree is going to fall very soon. <coughs> and that's why John says, at hand. John also said that Jesus' winnowing fork was already in his hand, and he would gather the wheat into the barn and burn the chaff. That's referencing Malachi 4 again. Uh, Dr. Craig, Craig S. Keener in the IVP Biblical Background Commentary of the New Testament said concerning Matthew 3.13, Winnowing was familiar to all Palestinian Jews, especially to the farmers. They would throw the harvested wheat into the air, and the wind would separate the heavier grain from the lighter chaff. And the chaff was useless for consumption and was normally burned. And so that's not, uh, that's not the tool that's used to, to, to begin the harvest. That's not the tool that's used to plant the seed. That is the very, one of the very last tools that you're using. Uh, in the separation of the wheat and of the tares. And so in Matthew 13, the harvest was right around the corner. The winnowing fan was already in his hand. Another passage that uh, utilizes this same imagery of the harvest is that of Revelation uh, chapter 14. And we'll notice this passage briefly, and then we have to move right along, of course, as, as, as our usual uh, mode is. In Revelation chapter 14, this is, takes place at the judgment of Babylon, the city where the Lord was slain. We see in verse uh, 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, and one on the cloud, like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had uh, power over fire. He cried 
a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle. Gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress press up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Now, uh, notice this harvest is, is a different um, uses a different produce than the harvest of Matthew 13. We have a harvest of Matthew 13, and Matthew 3 is a harvest of wheat and tares, whereas this this uh, harvest is a harvest of uh, good grapes versus bad grapes. But the harvest imagery is still the same. And it still comes from the same overall theme of, of agriculture that the Old Testament saints were used to um, in connection to eschatology. And the New Testament saints were used to it as well in connection to eschatology. So it's a very fitting theme. And so we see that Revelation 14 is about the time when one sitting on a cloud like a son of man would reap the earth at the appropriate hour. He says, now's, now's the time for you to reap. This harvest takes place at the fall of Babylon. And Babylon is the city where the Lord was slain, Revelation 11, verse 8. And, of course, Jesus was slain in Jerusalem. John the Baptist said that his message would be fulfilled in a time that could be described as at hand. John, who saw the apocalypse, likewise said that his book, including the harvest of Revelation 14, would be at hand and it would be fulfilled in a time that can be described as shortly in Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 and verse 3. And so with all this being said, let's take a pit stop back to Matthew 13 and just point out a few things uh, from this passage. Um, number one, we see that the Matthew 13 verse 30, again, to remind you, is the time of the burning of the chaff, the gathering of the righteous into the barn, something that John talks about in Matthew chapter 3. And something that was prophesied about in Malachi chapter 4 and Mal Malachi chapter 3. And something that uh, the New Testament writers reference as well as we've already seen. In fact, the whole idea of the resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection, is based off the harvest, based off the first fruits, and based off the, uh, the Feast of Booths that takes place later on in the festival calendar. Now, all of this, this harvest, would take place at the end of the age. And that's an age that Jesus was living in, Matthew 13, 39 and 40. The, uh, Jesus tells us when the righteous would shine forth as the sun. And that, as we've already mentioned, is a reference to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. Let's see what Daniel 12 says. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands with the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting content. There's our resurrection. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. So Jesus' application of this passage concerning the resurrection is, hey, this is going to take place at the end of this age. At the time of the harvest, at the time, as John would put it, the great and notable day of the Lord. And so we see conclusively that that time period that, that they all set up is the time of the last days of Old Covenant Israel being consummated in the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. You see how all this uh, fits together like a glove. And a lot of people in this catology is messed up because they're trying to put a glove on their foot. And that doesn't work out too well for them. But uh, Jesus posits the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 12 in the end of the age in AD 70, something that we will discuss even more. So let's talk about this uh, a little bit more. Uh, this Greek phrase, the end of the age, which I'm going to butcher this, but I'll try my best, soon to lead to Adonis, uh, is translated the end of the age. But what is this end of the age? Uh, in the maps, the chart section of the IVP Biblical Background Commentary of the New Testament, Dr. Craig S. Keener draws several charts about Jewish eschatology and historical Christian eschatology. And he shows that Jewish eschatology is, is basically a straight line with a, uh, with, a, with a line in between. 
and that is there's two ages, this age, the age to come. You look at Jesus' eschatology, it's the same thing. He says the holy blaspheme of the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or the age to come. He says sons of this age married and given in marriage, sons of that age don't in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, he says in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, or the apostles ask, and he responds concerning the end of this age, looking forward to the age to come. He sends the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to guide the apostles in all truth and reveal, re reveal to them good things to come. We have the feast days or types and shadows of good things to come. And see, that's, that's the difference. It's this age, the age to come. That's Jewish eschatology. Therefore, that's Jesus' eschatology. It's this age, the age to come. There's not any gap, any spaces. There's not any dashes. It is this age, and it's the age to come. And that's the eschatology of Paul that he describes in Matthew chapter, or rather in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, with the changing of the covenants. Now, since the Christian age has no end, now I get this now, God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It'll never be destroyed. It'll never be left to others. The increase of his government, Isaiah 9 says, there will be no end. So since, there, since the Christian age is something that has no end, it cannot be possible that the harvest takes place at the end of the Christian age. That only leaves one other age that the harvest can, take, can, can, come to a, can come to an end at, and that is the age of Moses, the, Messi the Mosaic age that Jesus said would end and that Jesus was living in, and he said that it would end within his generation, Galatians 4 and verse 4. He was born of woman, born under the law. And so when Jesus finishes the parables, Concerning the coming of the kingdom and the harvest and the end of the age, he asks his disciples a question. He says in verse 51, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. What did they understand? They understood that he was talking to them about the coming of the kingdom and the end of the very Jewish age in which they were living. This is why in Matthew 24, now this is extremely important. You get to Matthew 24. And the disciples, they ask, uh, Jesus tells them about the fall of the temple and about the crushing of the altar. And they ask him, they say, can you give us a sign? What will be the sign? That's one sign for two events. What will be the sign of your parousia, that is of your, of your presence, and of the end of the age? Where did they get this idea of the end of the age from? They got it not only from their own Old Testament studies, but they understood what it meant because of Jesus' discourse in Matthew chapter 13 regarding the harvest. And so they know that, and they said, we understand it. And so they ask, what is going to be the sign of the end of the age? They knew what the end of the age meant. And so Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 24, uh, in verse 14 and 15, their answer to their question. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, staying in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those in who are Judea flee to the mountains, etc., etc. Now get this. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet is a reference back to Daniel chapter 12. If you don't believe me, go read Daniel 12, and you'll see that's the case. This is the same passage that Jesus references in Matthew chapter 13 in dealing with the harvest. Do you see the connection? Daniel 12 is talking about the time of the end. It's talking about the greatest tribulation that ever was or ever would be. Uh, it's talking about the time of the resurrection. <clears throat> it's talking about the time of the harvest, according to Jesus in Matthew 13. It's talking about the time when Daniel would receive his inheritance. Well, what's well, Matthew chapter 13? Matthew chapter 13 is talking about the time of the end. It's talking about the time when the righteous will be purified and the wicked will be judged. It's talking about the time whenever the righteous will be gathered into the Father's barn, i.e. receiving their inheritance and eternal life. And all that would take place at the end of the age in which Jesus was living. But what's Matthew 24 talking about? Matthew 24 is talking about the end of the age. It's something that would take place within that generation. It's something that would be for the gathering together of the righteous, Matthew 24, verse 29 and 31. We look to Matthew 20, 25, and we see it's a time when they would inherit the eternal kingdom. What's Matthew 13 about? 
It's about it's a parable concerning the kingdom of God. You see how all this is connected? It's not all different things. It's all talking about the same thing. It's talking about one great end that Scripture had in view, and that was the end of the people that God had dealings with for uh, for two thousand years, and producing a people of a spiritual nature that you and that I can be a part of, in order that we can show forth the riches of His grace, world without end, according to Ephesians uh, chapter two. And so we should not be ashamed of this matter, but we should be proudly proclaiming it from the rooftops because surely it is a blessing to you and I and we can instill in others the same joy and the same peace that we have uh, through knowledge and through understanding of these things. It's the same end. It's the end of the age. And the end of the age is the time of the harvest. And that harvest would come according to Jesus in Matthew 24, 34 within that generation. Now, Matthew 24 like Matthew 13, is discussing the gathering of the saints. Notice Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven will be shaken, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Is that not uh, is that not Malachi chapter 4? And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect. But what is the gathering together of his elect but the harvest? Hosea chapter 6, verse 11. Hosea chapter 2, 20 to 23. Hosea chapter 1, 10 and 11. The regathering of Judah and Israel, inclusive of the Gentiles, according to the mystery of God. Uh, is the harvest. It is the time of life from the dead. Romans chapter 11 tells us that's what the restoration of Israel means. In other words, it's the time of resurrection. It's a time when they would shake off the dust of oppression and the dust of bondage, and they would inherit the new Jerusalem, which is love and free and mother of us all, Galatians uh, chapter 4 and the, and the allegory therein. And so all of this, as we've seen, fits together. And notice when it's placed. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, that's the generation that was living in the, this age of Matthew 13. This generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. That includes the parousia of Christ uh, from Matthew 24 and verse 27. That includes the gathering at sound of the great trumpet. That includes the coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That includes the shaking of heavens and earth. And uh, that, of course, includes the end of the age and the resurrection, the judgment of which we've had much to say uh, at this present hour. Now, not only was Jesus discussing the same subject matter in Matthew 24 that he was discussing in Matthew 13, but he also used uh, similar imagery. Now, watch this. In Matthew chapter 13, we had the separation of the wheat and the tares. In Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, we had the separation of the sheep and the goats. Notice what he says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Well, when would the Son of Man come in his glory? Well, let's take a look real quick. Matthew 24, uh, chapter 31, or chapter 30. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Simple enough, doesn't it, to you? Seems simple to me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. <coughs> There's the harvest. Do you see that? The harvest is the gathering of the wheat and the tares and the separation of them. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is the time of the inheritance. Well, does this include anybody that we're familiar with? Well, it includes Daniel, doesn't it? Daniel 12, verse 13, go your way till the end. That's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. That's the question, the one question that he's answering. 
When shall these things be? What will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? It's stated uh, in different question forms, but it's all talking about one big question, and that is, what are you talking about? Or when is the things that you're talking about going to take place, is what I meant to say. And they would take place at the time of the end. For you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance when? At the end of the days. What days is he talking about? He's talking about the days that he got done speaking of concerning the abomination of desolation and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And so this is the time of the inheritance. This is the time when they'd be gathered into the father's barn in order that they might enjoy uh, eternal life. This is a time when those wicked Jews and those who rejected the gospel of Christ were turned away and were told, depart from me, you that work uh, iniquity or you that practice lawlessness. And so, again, we see that these things all coincide, and they're not uh, 20 different subjects. They're all one complete subject discussing the time when Jesus come on the clouds with power and great glory to punish old covenant of Israel after the flesh and to punish those uh, Gentiles who rejected the gospel of Christ, to bless eternally forever, world without end, amen, and all of those who from then on, who then forth would follow Jesus to the best of their abilities and trust in him as their savior and appropriate his righteousness through faithfulness uh, to God. Now, Let's summarize, shall we? And we're going to summarize by going back through uh, the PowerPoint presentation in a quick eight-minute fashion. The parable of the wheat and tares <coughs> is often used to talk about a future judgment, but that removes it from the biblical setting in which it is in. It removes it from pulling imagery from uh, John the Baptist's preaching. It removes it from pulling imagery from some of the texts in the Old Testament. Some of the texts in the Old Testament that underlies the theme of the harvest is the feast days, it's Hosea, it's Malachi chapter 4. John the Baptist would be the one to indicate that this harvest or that this judgment was right around the corner, and he came preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We see in Matthew chapter 25, that the kingdom and the inheriting of the kingdom is directly connected to the separation of the good and the evil at the time of the coming of the Lord, power and great glory, which Jesus would say took place within his generation, Matthew 24, 34, and Matthew 24, verse 30. And so when John the Baptist arrives, it shows everyone, including the wicked uh, scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, that they needed to repent. Now, uh, John the Baptist references Malachi and the discourse concerning the great and terrible day of the Lord very often. And he even says about Jesus that his winnowing fan was in his hand, indicating that it wasn't simply uh, that the harvest was about to begin, but the harvest was, was, about to, was, was about to take place and that the wheat were about to be separated and that the axe was already laid to the root of the tree. And John, the uh, revelator in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1 and 3, and Revelation chapter 14, talking about the harvest, says that it would take place shortly, and it would take place at a time that could be described as at hand. And so Jesus, when he gets uh, to that subject of the harvest in Matthew chapter 13, he says it would take place at the, at the end of this age, that is the age in which he was living, the end of the old covenant age, and it would be fulfilled at the same time that Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 was fulfilled, a passage concerning the resurrection of the just and the unjust at the end of the age. Furthermore, we saw in Matthew chapter 24 that Jesus posits the end of the age within his generation after the completion of the, of the gospel mission uh, to the ends of the world. And so we see that gospel mission was for the purpose of bringing back home the lost sheep of the house of Israel and of Judah, and at the same time, showing the light of life to the Gentiles. Uh, because it was too small of a thing for God just to reconcile Israel and Judah, but he's also going to extend mercy to the Gentiles, something that Paul indicates was being fulfilled within his time. Furthermore, Peter shows that Israel was being reconciled because of his comments in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses, uh, nine, or verses, 10 and, or verses 9 and 10, 
indicating that the restoration and the harvest and that the gathering was all on the brink in the process of taking place. And then uh, lastly, we saw how Matthew chapter 25 and Matthew chapter 24 as well correlates to Matthew 13 and to Daniel chapter 12 and to Malachi chapter 4, indicating that all these subjects were all concerned with one great end uh, that would bring about everlasting righteousness and would, would once and for all demonstrate who the, who the sons of God are, and that is the members of the church, the body of Christ, uh, who would then uh, be, be the partakers of everlasting life in order to show forth the riches of the grace of God, world without end, Amen. And friends, uh, that is the lesson for today. And I didn't make my announcements at the start of the lesson, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, make those announcements uh, now. One of those lessons that we need, or one of those announcements that we need to make, is concerning the debate between uh, Don K. Preston and David uh, and David Hester. If you go to Don's uh, Facebook page. And you scroll down, you'll be able to find the dates for uh, the Hester Preston debate. And uh, I'll try to find those for you uh, really quick. I should have looked that up prior to. Um, but it's going to be in June at the Eastern Meadows Church of Christ uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm going to be there if I, if I can. And also, I hope to meet some of you there as well. And I'll try to get those dates for you, but um, huh, I'm not finding them here any recently on uh, Don's Facebook page, at least in the past few days. And so what we're going to do is just take a shot in the dark, because I think I know when it's going to be anyways. And uh, I want to say it's the, well, I better not do that, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it messed up. But if you go back and you look at, at Don Preston's Facebook page, and you watch those videos that uh, he has available, uh, the morning musings, then you should be able to find those dates relatively, uh, relatively easy. <clears throat> Actually, I've got it right here. Uh, the Hester debate is going to take place June the 15th. So I was right. Uh, June the 15th at 7 p.m. at the Eastern Meadows Church of Christ. And you're going to be able to find that uh, on Facebook, an event uh, for you to go there. Another announcement that I wanted to make is that my website, labornotinvain.com, is freshly updated for your convenience. I'll show some of that off now. You'll see that the uh, opening page is a lot more compact so that you can find it easy. You'll find a recent podcast section, a recent post section. You can search by tags, and you can also subscribe to the blog via email, and I'd really suggest that you do that. This podcast archive section. Uh, is is a lot more accessible, and if you uh, if you click on the read more section in this podcast archive, you'll be able to find the notes and the downloadable MP3, and hopefully that'll be uh, really really helpful to you in your studies, and I hope that you can benefit from that in some way. <coughs> well, we've only got about a minute left in our broadcast for this evening, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you so much for being here today. Hope that God blesses you beyond all measure, and I hope that you were able to gain something from our time together today. Have a great week, and God bless. Hello, I'm William Bell with Fulfill Radio. For the past hour, you've been listening to Face to Face with Daniel Rogers. For more information, visit his website at www.labornotinvain.com. And remember to tune in each Sunday at 8 a.m. for another exciting journey of Face to Face with Daniel Rogers right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.